Hey everybody and welcome to True Crime Paranormal with the Psychic Sisters. This is Katie Weaver and I'm here with my co-host and partner in crime, Christy Brower. Hello. Hello. Hey everybody. Excited to be here. You know, I can't help but do a little chair dance to our new intro because I love it and I love the music and I'm sorry if someone doesn't, but I like it. <laughs> And the music is funny. We've had a few people really hate it, and a lot of people really love it. And it's just music. I love it. I just, I'm just rocking out to it, just mm -hmm. bouncing right along till we, we come on. We thought it sounded so. kind of like 1970s gumshoe detective-ish, you know? Yeah. Kind we of like it. Monk. Did you guys watch Monk? It reminds me of Monk's intro music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love it. Well... We are glad to be here. Uh, this is a little different kind of show for us. I hope you guys will bear with us. Uh, I'm going to tell you what this show is and why we're doing it. So this is a show talking about the Lamanite or Indian placement program that the Mormon church ran from the late 1940s into 2000. And there's a couple of reasons why we have chosen to do this episode. Uh, as many of you know, we are former Mormons and are, uh, you know, fairly well schooled in the ways of the LDS church. And if you followed us for a while, you know that we have done a lot of episodes with the Daybell Vallow case, particularly ones to help decipher a lot of the Mormon speak, the scripture speak, the culture mm -hmm. of the Mormon mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. Things like that, that people on the outside may be very puzzled about. And so For sure. in light of all of the residential school uh, right now in Canada, we've done two stories on this already, and I'm sure there's more to come, but they mm -hmm. are currently uh, searching the grounds of, it looks like at this point, probably all, hopefully all 139 former Indian residential schools in Canada. As of this recording, to the best of our knowledge, they have searched five of those schools and they have come up with 1,500 unmarked graves of First Nations children. I, oh, makes now, me stick to my stomach to think about it. Yeah, and hold on to your seats because mm -hmm. there are still 137 schools to search and there are somewhere around 340 in the United States to search. Mm. Will the U.S. do it? They don't. I don't know that they'll have a choice. Do all of those schools still remain or, or the re grounds of those schools? Probably not. We'll never have mm. a complete number as to mm. how many children died in residential schools uh, that went completely, completely unnoticed. Yeah. To, not to their families, but to the outside world. So because of that, we were talking a little about something that we had heard about a little as kids but didn't know much about, and that was the Lamanite Placement Program. Yikes. The name. Mm -hmm. We'll tell and you if why. If y'all aren't Mormon, you don't even know what the hell that mm -hmm. word is. <laughs> yep. uh, yes, and we'll get to that. I, Upon a little more research, we were dumbfounded to discover that 50,000 American Native, well, Native American children have been through that placement program. We're going to give you the facts to the best of our knowledge from many different sources. Mm -hmm. We'll let you form your own opinions on uh, what you think. I mean, there are some who still believe this program was really beneficial. There are many that believe it was not, but we're just going to explain it to you to the best of our knowledge. Yes. Yes, we are. And I, I think that you can also maybe look at this about in the aspect of that there were good parts and bad parts. Mm -hmm. um, because certainly some people, you know, were glad to have done it. But there's some stuff you're going to find out that mm -hmm. doesn't feel so good. Well, questionable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And we want to make it clear. We're not here to Mormon bash. We're not no. here to trash the LDS church. That's not our goal. We are not bitter, feuding formers. We're just going to lay out the facts to you. So no. that's where we're at with it. And, uh, it's you know. It's just important to acknowledge this part of our history that gets so brushed under the rug. Mm -hmm. This idea that Native American children needed to be forcefully assimilated into white culture. Yeah. 
Yeah. And we, we, we got to know about it, you know. Without a doubt. So to really understand the relationship between white Mormons and the Native Americans, you have to understand a little bit about the Book of Mormon. That is their, uh, that is their religious text. And in the Book of Mormon, they teach that there are four ancient peoples or four different tribes, the Jaredites, the Molochites, the Nephites, and the Lamanites. According to the Book of Mormon, they settled the Americas and the Lamanites were a very important part of this. So in the Book of Mormon narrative, the Lamanites begin as wicked rivals to the Nephites. So Nephi and Laman were brothers and somehow their father was Lehi and somehow uh, Nephi was the chosen son and those that followed Nephi were the chosen ones. And Nephi learned that his brothers were trying to kill him. And so he and his followers left and went into the wilderness and started calling themselves the Nephites. They were the righteous ones. They were the good guys of the story. They were, dare I say it, white and delightsome. Oh, we're going to get to that term, aren't we? Oh, Ooh. that term. Oh, I hate that term mm -hmm. so much. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the bad guys were referred to as the Lamanites. So the belief in the Book of Mormon was that the Lamanites, because they were just so bad, were cursed and cut off from the presence of the Lord. They received a skin of blackness so they would not be enticing to the Nephites. That's who they believe Native Americans to be. Yeah. Now, later on in the Book of Mormon, they actually, after they supposedly wore for two uh, centuries or two uh, millennia, they, uh, they finally uh, become friends again. And their belief now is that it is the Mormons' jobs to help pull the Lamanites back into the ways of righteousness. That's their belief. There's a few things from the original Book of Mormon that is interesting. Uh, they made some changes. In December 2010, they changed some of the summaries in the footnotes of the Book of Mormon. Uh, mm. In 2 Nephi, the original wording was, because of their unbelief, the Lamanites are cursed to receive a skin of blackness and become a scourge to the Nephites. They've actually now changed the phrase skin of blackness and the passage is changed to because of their unbelief, the Lamanites are cut off from the presence of the Lord, are cursed and become a scourge unto the Nephites. Well, they the second out skin of blackness. Uh huh. Uh, the second change happens in the summary uh, of Mormon uh, five. Formerly, it included the phrase, the Lamanites shall be a dark, filthy, and loathsome people. The new version has deleted the phrase dark, loathsome, and filthy, and now reads, the Lamanites will be scattered, and the spirit will cease to strive within them. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, considering that we grew up in the Mormon church in the late 70s and early mm -hmm. 80s, 80s and 90s, uh, we, we learned it with the original phrasing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. And definitely the people we grew up around did yep. because racism runs strong here and particularly against Native Americans. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It is... Spencer W. Kimball, who later became the prophet, who was the guiding force in creating the Lamanite uh, placement program. And 
in a 1960s, uh, 1960 general conference address. That's general conferences held twice a year. It's where the uh, members of the church gather to hear from their leaders. He said this, I saw a striking contrast in the progress of the Indian people today. The day of the Lamanites is nigh. For years, they have been growing delightsome, and they are now becoming white and delightsome as they were promised. In this picture of the 20 Lamanite missionaries, 15 of the 20 were light as Anglos, five were darker, but equally delightsome. The children in the home placement program in Utah are often lighter than their brothers and sisters in the Hogan's on the reservation. At one meeting, a father and mother and their 16 year old daughter we represent, the little member girl, 16, sitting between the dark father and mother, and it was evident she was several shades lighter than her parents. On the same reservation, in the same Hogan, subject to the same sun and wind and weather. These young members of the church are changing to whiteness and to delightsomeness. One white elder jokingly said he and his companion were donating blood regularly to the hospital in hope that the process might be accelerated. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's a picture of Spencer W. Kimball mm -hmm. with some of the kids from the school. Mm -hmm. Or not the school, but from the program. From the program. Yeah. Yep. See how white and delightsome he is? Mm. I'm just horrified by that. I'm language. trying to stay with my friends, but it's tough. This is tough for me. Mm-hmm. You know, we were children when all of this was going on, and so we didn't understand at the time. Mm -hmm. We had family that did have Lamanite placement children. Um, to our recollection, it didn't last very long, and we know that our mother was furious about it. Yes, she was she... always a real champion for Native American rights, and I saw her throw down many times with some of our dad's uh, siblings yeah. over racial comments and remarks. And she, um, you know, she, she always was horrified by this level of racism. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the program itself. It was the biggest during the 60s and the 70s. More than 50% of the children that went through the program were from the Navajo Nation from Arizona and from New Mexico. But they did have, they had children from many, many different tribes. Uh, from 1948 to 2000, close to 50,000 children went through the program. They had to be eight years old at least and baptized into the church. In the Mormon church, children are baptized into the church's members at eight. So where were these kids coming from? Well. There was a huge push to baptize Native Americans. Again, remember, in their own scriptural text, they believed that it was their job to, remember, help them become white and delightsome right. and fulfill the prophecy of them turning back to the Lord and receiving all of their former glory. So missionaries and missionary work on reservations has been really heavily applied. So they had recruiters and missionaries that would basically search the reservations for any kids that were qualified. So the host families were screened pretty heavily. They had to be, they had to be at a certain income level. So you had to be a fairly rich white Mormon person in order to take in a foster. And that's what they called them, were foster children. Even um, though this wasn't any kind of official governmental anything. No, but the U.S. government actually gave them the nod. Yeah. So the they outside were. reasoning was that they were bringing these uh, Native American children into their homes and helping to provide them with a good education because maybe on the reservation, they weren't receiving a good education. Well, I, that's probably, uh, you know, maybe that's true, maybe it isn't, 
But that was kind of the, the surface idea behind it. The problem with it was that A, they had to become baptized in order to do so. There is a really interesting article, and we'll share our links in the uh, comments, but from Indian Country Today that said that uh, lots of kids were baptized that had no idea what they were doing, that they were just told you have to do this thing so that you can join this program and come get these great educations. And that's what these kids wanted. And a lot of them wanted to see the outside world, you know, mm -hmm. and so that's and maybe some of their friends were doing it. And so they were becoming baptized members of the church without ever really understanding why. Not all of them, of course, but some of them. So according to Indian Country Today, their article, they said that, uh, and the article is called How Mormons Assimilated Native Children, by the way. Uh, they said that foster families were selected based on strong marital relationships, high moral standards, activity in the church, financial circumstances, and a desire to help a Lamanite child gain an education. Now, families were promised native children free from disease and free from serious emotional disturbance. Yeah, they didn't want any sick kids coming in. Yeah. They would bring students in mostly to Utah and Idaho. And when they would bring them, they'd pick them up in buses from their reservations typically in the fall because they did go home, most of them in the summertime. And when they'd bring them home, they'd send them through a health monitoring station where they would... Uh, shower them and shampoo their hair before they were allowed to, you know, enter the Mormon family's homes. Mm. They had to, you know, be uh, antiseptized or that's not the right word, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They had to go through the hand sanitizer wash basically before they were allowed to enter their homes. Because remember the things that have been said, yeah. I don't, I'm not going to say the words, but when they were home, they were encouraged very strongly and actually prohibited from attending any kind of Native American religious activity or ceremony. Right. So while their families were attending powwows and drums and smokes and lodges and all other kinds of ceremony, these children were expected to abstain from that because they didn't believe in that anymore because that was not a tenant of the LDS church. Mm -hmm. It created a huge divide between them and their families. They were told that they were to serve as an example to their families of the way that you are supposed to live. And so basically they sent these kids back home to their families to judge the shit out of them for mm -hmm. all of their wrong lifestyle choices and try to convert them to Mormonism. Yep. After, oh. you know, they had, of course, been assimilated mm -hmm. into white Mormon culture. Mm -hmm. Only one third of children that entered the program uh, actually graduated as seniors. Most children only made it a short time before they uh, were too homesick or they went for a year or two and decided that actually they wanted to be Native Americans or yeah. there were issues at home or whatever. But most kids, you know, only one third of them actually managed to go the distance. Uh, two thirds of them did not. Right. Uh, the other part of it was language. They were taught that it was rude to speak their native tongue and that they should only ever speak English because that's so rude to do to the English speakers. And so they weren't allowed really? to speak their native tongue while they were in placement because uh, that would be a rude thing to do, don't you know? Right. Yeah. So, and again, there was certainly a level of people, one third at least, who did make it all the way through the program and did come out of that, hopefully with good educations. Uh, right. You know, 
hopefully uh, they did have good experiences. The stripping down of their culture is one of the biggest concerns besides just separating children from their families for no good reason. Right. And then separating them emotionally and mm -hmm. by language and by culture, mm -hmm. like, you know, it, they literally were breaking up families. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because those families either became Mormon like their child or they became estranged because yeah. they just didn't fit each other anymore. Yep. Yep. Without a doubt. Do you want me to show this other picture? Yeah. Let's look at this picture. Oh, it's pretty pixelated. This is just one of many, many pictures on the internet of your cute little white suburban family with their token Native American child. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, what happened in the 60s and 70s, particularly with this program, is it became the fashionable thing to do. Right. And a lot of people took on fosters because they wanted to be one of the cool kids. Also, you couldn't do it unless you were at a certain income level. So if you were taking on Native kids, that meant that you were rich. And it became well, yeah, a social because you had to pay for thing. everything for them. They were yes. not, there was no, the Mormon church managed this, but there was no actual support from the Mormon church. No. There was no money. Um, this was, you will take this child into your home and provide for all of their needs while they're with you. Right. The only thing the church paid for were social workers. Right. And there were supposed to be social workers that really, uh, you know, kept an eye on all of the kids and an eye on the whole system and made sure that everybody was okay. The problem is the program grew really big. In 1966 and 67, there were 1,569 students let that sink in. Nearly 1,600 students in the program and 19 caseworkers. Whoa. Yeah. So that was 85 students for every caseworker. And they were spread out mostly in Idaho and Utah, but not all in the same place, not all in the yeah. same communities. Yeah. The, initially, the program was supposed to be set up so the caseworkers had a presence in all of the students' lives or keeping an eye on them, right. but they couldn't, they weren't, it wasn't even possible for that to mm -hmm. happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That opens the door for a lot of abuse. And that's my biggest worry. Now in 2016, four uh, native Americans from the Navajo nation filed suit against the church for sexual abuse that they endured while they were in the program. Now you might look at that number and go, well, four out of 50,000, I mean. The problem is in the Mormon church, there's a really big problem with sex abuse. Yeah. And if you aren't familiar with all of the Boy Scout sex abuse stuff that happened amongst the Mormon church, familiarize yourself. Yeah, but look it up. But uh, that it's a huge problem. And my biggest worry and wonder and suspicion is that a great many of these children were sexually abused while they were in care. Mm -hmm. I can't prove that. You want to come for me in the comments? Go ahead and do it. But that's my belief. It, it is mine as well. And and uh, honestly, who are these kids going to tell? Exactly. Who are they going to tell that would do anything? You know, we have heard stories yeah. also about um, kids in this program who were basically just indentured servants. Oh, oh that, yeah. You know, they were the basically the the house made mm -hmm. while they lived in these homes. Yeah. And yeah, the the rampant sexual abuse in Mormon culture is horrifying. And yeah, I if four dared come forward, there are so many more. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. And actually, probably so many more have come forward and just got shut down mm -hmm. because that's kind of how that works. People right. in the Mormon church, their first, uh, the first person they'll talk to about abuse of any sort will be their bishop. And 
a lot of times the bishop closes the door right there and they don't really make it any further than there. And I would imagine in these cases, that's exactly what happened. Well, and you have to understand in Mormonism, the bishop is lay clergy. They might be mm -hmm. a mechanic or a farmer during the day. Mm -hmm. They're not actually, they've been through a little bit of training, but they're not actually like educated to handle situations like that at all. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you're supposed to go tell your bishop if anything goes wrong in your life, but your bishop may not be any help to you at all yeah. because that's not really what they were trained for. Yeah. Yep. So they did change their program in 1972. They changed the program so that their local priesthood leaders, like bishops and state presidents, were responsible for recruiting and screening new students. So because of that, they were basically sending members out into every reservation around them, just basically knocking on doors, trying to recruit kids into these programs to come and live with them. So you might be wondering, why the hell would anybody send your kid to do this, right? right. Well... What if you're living in abject poverty? What if your kids are definitely not getting the educations that you know they're going to need to survive in this current world? What if you're having a hard time feeding them? Yeah. You know, and what if these people come knocking on your door that seem pretty damn nice that say, we'll pay for everything. We'll pay for everything. Yeah. All you have to do is join our church. We'll pay for everything. They can come and live with a family that has everything that you don't. And, you know, we'll, we'll do the rest. And a lot of people did it because it seemed like a great opportunity. And for some people it was. Well, and like, who are you going to say no to that? Like, I mean, I can kind of see it from both sides, you know, like sure. you may face a lot of backlash. Like you would say no to that. Why would you not do that for your kids? You know? Right. Yeah. Except for that, the continued massive loss of culture came into play and that's what uh that is such a huge worry and also just looking at the really really problematic views that the mormon church espoused uh towards yeah. the native americans the lamanites in 1971 by this time quite a few you know a lot of kids had graduated from high school and gone on to brigham young university in Provo, Utah, or Ricks College here in Rexburg, where I live, and which is now Brigham Young University, Idaho. But at any rate, um, there was actually, at that time, there was a group that formed a singing and performing group formed at BYU, I call, or at BYU called the Lamanite Generation. Yeah, they actually, mm -hmm performed and toured, you know, they, they put them on tour so everybody could see how great their Indians were doing. Right. Yeah. The, the self-congratulatory yeah. crap out of this is just, it's very tough to take. Yeah. Yeah. So in this early seventies, uh, it was starting to lose a little steam. Like the public eye was starting to go, what a, what is this all about? Mm -hmm. In 1977, the U.S. government commissioned a study to investigate accusations that activists had been making that the church was using its influence to push children into joining their program, therefore joining their church. And because, they, yeah, they were. They were. The commission found that the kids, by and large, were doing fine and decided it should stay. But, um, we're learning a lot about, you know, the Canadian and U.S. governments and a lot of things we already knew about their relationships with Native Americans. So I'm going to have a really hard time, uh, you know, giving a damn what they said in 1977. Me too. And, and particularly because you have to understand Mormons are taught from the time they are tiny children that is their job to do missionary work. It is their job to bring more people into this religion. Yeah. That is deeply, deeply ingrained. And so you know that's what this really was. Yeah. And and that's what people who took these kids in, that's what yeah. they thought they were doing. You know, I 
Mm. Yeah. This wasn't yeah. just out of the goodness of their heart. There was a benefit in their oh, eyes yeah. to the Mormon oh, church yeah. to do this. You know, in the 90s in Rexburg, it became the fashionable thing to do to adopt black babies. Yeah. All of these white families were adopting African-American children and doing the very same thing. Yes. Adopting them, not fostering them, but adopting them so they could raise them in the church. This is... White and black. Mm -hmm. The most, yeah. one of honestly the sickest phrases I've ever heard come out of a church. I don't care about what church White it is. White and Or yeah. what religion it is. This one makes me ill. Me too. Me too. So that's pretty much it. I mean, it had mostly phased out, it looks like, by the 80s, but there was still a program in place that ran. Uh, Loosely and still had a few kids in and out of it until 2000 when it was finally ended. Yeah. And it's, you know, there are a lot of stories of people who had a horrible experience and, and, and stories of people who had a good experience. Mm -hmm. But I, that's not really the issue as far as I'm concerned. The issue is the destruction of people's culture. Yeah. The assimilation, the idea that because you're white, you're better, and it's your job to just lift them up rather than leaving them the hell alone to live their own lives. Exactly. It, it's the same thing that those Indian boarding schools did in Canada and here in the U.S. It's just got a little bit of a sweet spot added to it, you know, mm -hmm. but it's the yeah. same idea. It is. The, the, the kids in this the program were arguably safer, maybe. When you're talking about uh, the huge lack of oversight they had, I don't know if you can really safely say that. We don't have numbers mm -hmm. for how many children perished in this program. And hopefully there weren't many and they were being tracked, I hope. But again, everything we read, everything we see, there have been plenty filtered out, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And most certainly if those kinds of things had happened they would be 100 percent covered up yeah they oh. just would that's just how it is yeah well and and so that that lawsuit was interesting um mm -hmm. because it was filed in a native court mm -hmm. and the mormon church came back and tried to get it thrown out and say that the native court didn't have the right to file this mm -hmm. And it went to a judge who said, yeah, actually, you have to, um, you know, try every res resolution possible with the native court before you can move on yeah. to any other court. I can't find that there was any resolution to that. Can you? It settled out of court. And that's what I figured. Is it settled out of court and that mm -hmm. no one's allowed to speak about it? Yes. However... It was a good victory it, in the, well, hopefully for the people who settled, but it was also a good mm -hmm. victory in the, uh, the manner of jurisprudence, you know, that they did have the right, that they were given the right to, or, you know, it was found that, yeah, they absolutely could sue somebody and bring it to tribal court. And if yeah. you don't like it, too bad. That's how it's going. Yeah. I, I liked that because the, the Mormon church has flexed its muscles in court over many things over the years. Yeah. And I, I do feel that was good that to, to give um, yeah. the tribe back their own power. Yeah. That has been taken in so many ways. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Katie told me I was supposed to be just, <laughs> you know, not have any emotional response to any of this, but... <laughs> But it's really hard for me to not have an emotional response no. to this. I knew you Be would. But I also knew that if we came in here with our guns blazing and we already get accused of hating the church and of attacking the church. And we're not doing that. We're just telling the truth that sometimes, uh, you know, it makes people uncomfortable. And we know that we'll probably catch some flack for this episode and we don't care. So, you no, know, we, we flack away, don't. whatever. We don't care. But no, uh, stories have to be told, yes. you guys. We grew up as Mormon kids and we barely mm -hmm. had a slight little recollection that there was something like this. Yeah. 
we'd heard of it, but we had no idea, you know, until we were adults. And even now, just really understanding what this really was about. Yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, when you talk about true crime, is this true crime? Hell yes, it is. And do we need to be bringing the attention, um, our attention and the attention of all of you to things like this? Yeah, we do. Absolutely. Because this is a part of our um, history that is just whitewashed. Yeah. Someday we'll do an episode, hopefully with help, on the uh, Hawaiian situation. Oh, I cannot think of the name of it right now, but there was also a Hawaiian encampment in Utah that uh, the Hawaiians that were brought here to be assimilated. And it is equally horrifying, though it didn't affect nearly as many people. And we'll do an episode on that one. I really mm -hmm. want to get some help with that one and be able to interview somebody. Because, again, that's a pretty secretive situation. But it is that whole idea, again, of assimilating people into white culture, into white religion, into Christianity. Mm -hmm. rather than respecting other people's cultures. And as yeah. far as I'm concerned, that's a crime against humanity. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. And then, of course, if you look back further into early Mormonism, the war be that the Mormons waged on the Native Americans in Utah and in Idaho yeah. is horrifying. And we're not even going to do that today, but it, it is horrifying. So, yeah. We wanted to take a hard look at this. We wanted to be able to report on it and bring it to you guys, especially in light of all of the revelations coming out right now. Hey, if we're going to shine a light, if we're going to come clean, we're going to pull all the blankets off, right? Right. Well, so, and we're going to do it from, you know, our own perspective and our own cultures that we grew up with. Absolutely. Guys, let us know. Did your, we know the Catholic Church was involved in these, in the Indian boarding schools, but did you grow up around any kind of program like this? You know, maybe for um, another ethnicity. I don't know. If you know of something else, go to truecrimeparanormalpodcast.com and drop us a message and tell us about it because we want to talk about these things. But as you can see, they're kept pretty hush hush and people don't like to talk about them because obviously it didn't look so good. Yeah, for sure. So if you know something, share it with us, please. Yeah. What do they say? If you see something, say something. Right. You know something else about it. We want to know. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. This has been yet another production of True Crime Paranormal. This is our Tuesday show. We'll be back tomorrow with a cold read case. We'll be back Wednesday night with case updates. And then we'll be back Thursday night with the psychic hour and hopefully some pop ups this weekend. We just yeah. have need to put our feet on the floor I i'm think not going have. anywhere so i <laughs> by damn i'm doing a pop-up <laughs> me too man we're worn out busy, you guys yeah. <laughs> we, we've been partying too hard this summer we're both just that's half true. uh well we need to lay on the couch that's yeah that's what's true <laughs> but, uh, thanks so much for you guys for being here be sure and check out our first case this week uh talking a whole lot more about Lori vallow and the murder of charles vallow really really yeah big bombshell information that came out of Chandler last week. So be sure you check that out and uh, yeah, like, follow, share, comment, the things, you know how mm -hmm. it goes. Subscribe. Thanks so much guys for being here. This has been true crime paranormal with the psychic sisters. Bye guys.